ladies and gentlemen. Today, our theme is legal thinking and decision making. And I'm delighted to introduce two legal minds, Philip Koh and Kamrash Nayakam. Philip studied law at the University of Malaya and later on completed his master's in law at King's College, London. He did a second master in theology with a heavy dose of philosophy at the Catholic University in Australia. And he was a Fulbright scholar at Harvard University reading economics. Kamraj read literature and law at Trinity Cantab or Cambridge University. Both have the breadth of experience and passion for teaching and analysis, advisory and advocacy in dispute resolution. And interestingly, both share a passion for literature. Today, they will be speaking about legal thinking and the art of persuasion for decision making. Legal persuasion uses a variety of discourse methods influenced by precedents and past practices. Nevertheless, they have to cope with the dynamic changes in economics, technology, and other such critical influences. So legal education is thus more than understanding the, arg the art of arg argumentation and the traditional type of tra training. To be relevant, it cannot avoid to have an understanding of AI and the 4.0 technology. Ethics, anthropology, sociology, and behavioral economics. In this context, since both of them share a love for imaginative literature, they will be illustrating the discussion using imaginative literature and moral imagination with some doses of metaphors, analogies, and the like. Making connections is the critical concept that unites persuasion, science, and the rhetorical thinking of law and the real life practice of persuasion. I now like to invite Philip to expand on this theme. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Paul. Thank you for the very kind invitation for me and my partner, uh, Kar uh, Kamaraj, to join in this conversation, I call it this afternoon. My remit is to introduce the topic, and though uh, I often think that PowerPoint can be power without points and points without power, and all that we need to do is to listen to the real stuff is in between, right? We we need to now, uh, I need to give the framework for the discussion today. The discussion today deals with legal thinking and decision making. And in my first slide, Caroline, slide, I have tried to show that in the objective of this forum is to have a robust conversation with my partner and of course Dr. Paul and all of you all who wish to participate. We wish to explain legal thinking as a type of discourse. The ancient word is used rhetoric, although we use the word rhetoric, ah, that is so rhetorical or rhetor, it's just pure rhetoric in a pejorative sense. The ancient art of rhetoric is a very important species of uh, uh, legal thought because legal thought frames itself in language and how we persuade the decision maker to our point of view is in fact uh, part of the discourse that we want to share with. 
I would like to relate legal thinking in the context of commercial. I know that many listeners today, the bulk of it is actually business people, entrepreneurs, uh, professionals in your own field. Uh, I'm glad we are not dominated by lawyers, but whether you are a businessman or you are a professional, sooner or later you will come across uh, contracts, you will come across uh, rules of law that will constrain your decision making and your conduct. And this is where, again, legal thinking is brought to bear in a commercial context. Uh, my, my partner, Kamraj, being a dispute resolution partner of mine, will talk about it in terms of the, the previous slide, please, uh, Carol. The dispute resolution context, uh, and perhaps when he has to deal with the, uh, uh, the persuading the arbitrator or the uh, uh, adjudicator. Am I still being heard? Hello? Yes, yes. 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 Okay, sorry. My, yes. my, my screen seemed to have just uh, disappeared. Anyway, then we, I also like to highlight uh, lawyer, uh, legal thinking in terms of uh, public discourse. You know, we have various issues in the public square concerning grave constitutional issues which intersect with political uh, uh, alignment, choices that we make, whether in election or in major public law cases. Obviously, legal thinking has a role to play in that discourse too. So we have put ourselves in a very large remit, maybe not as large as what Paul would want us to deal with, anthropology and sociology and all that. That is too wide a remit. We try to confine this to what I just highlight. In my next uh, slide, I try to explain that legal thinking, what is it? It is some sort of esoteric uh, process. Well, we all know that the beginning of legal thought came out of uh, political and even theological backgrounds. But in the maturing of legal systems, legal reasoning takes its place, all right? Takes its place within the set of legal rules of a system and the society that we are operating in. In our Malaysian society, we are in 21st century, uh, part of a market society. We would, we would call ourselves a democratic nation, but we have our peculiar institutional and cultural issues too. For example, our laws are not merely purely uh, secular laws. We have Sharia, financial instruments that are Sharia based. We have personal laws that are that are based on Islamic. So Malaysian system is a bit of a hybrid of common law, market society, and a modern liberal democratic society, but based upon the respect for the constitutional monarch and of course the role of race and religion we all know dominate legal thinking even. Sometimes they even trump what we as perhaps secular lawyers would say, uh, the legal thought that would undergird that rule. But more about that in an example later. So legal thinking takes its place within the norms as derived from statutory interpretation. It also derived from what we call, for those of us who are non-lawyers, we call that common law rules, which are laid down by judicial precedence. Precedence is one word which governs many of legal thinking. If I sit in a boardroom, if I explain directors' duties to directors, I would then tell them about a precedent that may guide their action. And in the new announcement that in 1st June, we have a new section called Section 17A of the MACC Act, I would bring to bear 
an interpretation of the section, whether or not, whether or not the uh, board of directors would have acted properly if they have used an independent contractor or a runner, we use a word, uh, to pay a commission, would they be exposed to a prosecution under the new, new rules that will come into place in 1st June? So we have statutory interpretation, we have precedence because in England, which we copied the section 17A from the UK Bribery Act, we have examples of case precedence. So legal thinking takes its place both as interpreting a specific legislative provision and also common law case precedence. And often they will be applied by way of analogy, by way of comparison. Now, some of the basic features of legal reasoning, Caroline, next slide, is that we, we need to attend to the fact that lawyers will obviously bring to bear their expertise by referring specific legal rules that may be applicable to the case situation. Again, let me give example of a commercial context. I enter a boardroom, they're about to do a hostile takeover bid, or they, are, they have just received a takeover offer, or there is a solvency issue. And because of COVID-19, we now have issues of whether a forced mayor contract could not be performed because of MCO. Then, as a lawyer, I will bring to bear uh, rules of contract law or rules of uh, takeover code to advise the board. Board members, decision makers I call them, need to listen carefully so that they have an informed position. This is very vital. Make use of your legal uh, advisors. Make use of them in a manner that will allow you to make an informed decision, without which you would be exposed to liabilities and costs, which therefore will be punitive both to the company and could also expose the person to a personal liability. So we, as lawyers, legal thinking and reasoning bring to bear principles of law, case precedents and rules to apply to the factual matrix that may be confronting the uh, decision makers. And as I have said, we would also call to place case precedents to advise and to bring concreteness and practicality to the situation. And now I pause and we now go into the whole issue of legal thinking as part of a way of persuading, a way of narrating. The next slide, please, Caroline. I have termed this as na legal narrative. Specialists in the art of persuasion have told us that the cognitive capacity of decision makers or listeners that you're addressing would normally relate themselves much more readily and connect the word used by Paul, all right, if there is a narrative which they can associate with. In fact, if there is a dispute in a courtroom, we can immediately see that there is a dispute and a contest between two narratives. An accused person will say the narrative of why he should be available, be availed of a defense, that he's innocent of the misconduct. The prosecutor would seek to persuade both by documentary evidence and by witnesses that the narrative that the individual under investigation, in fact, has, conduct, has misconducted himself or herself. So narrative telling and the ability to connect both in terms of persuasiveness in propositional form and in using uh, uh, the word we use, in using metaphors, in using a storyline that may be convincing. I'll give an example. During the time of uh, Suhakam hearing, uh, when we were advising uh, the family of the abducted pastor and the alleged Shiite Amri, 
place hope, we commended the narrative that regardless of whether these individuals could have contravened the law, that the authorities should apply the law, not to abduct or disappear these individuals. And that is the narrative of these two individuals that they are performing charitable acts among marginalized community. And because of their background, one a pastor, the other a large, a large Shiite, uh, may have offended the authorities. There is no position that the law should take where extra legal abduction or disappearance should take place. Clearly, the narrative that we commended found acceptance with the Sohakam panel and they so found. So there is this competing narratives that would be brought to bear. The police argument was, well, it is just a case where somebody was kidnapped or perhaps a person left the country and we do not know why or where. So our narrative was vindicated in the finding. So in, in, in the art of legal thinking and persuasion, it is important to construct a narrative. It is important to construct it, of course, based on logical uh, flow of a chronicling of the event backed by careful evidential support. It is not just telling a story, all right? You, 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 this is not the point. That there is a discipline in the commending of that narrative. Uh, we quoted from a book that contemporary rhetorical theory and cognitive science agree that the interpretive framework that work with decision makers when they hear you, because they filter, they focus and they frame, is that when we help them to see what we want them to see and to think along the line by a compelling narrative. So my next slide, and I would stop soon, and I will invite Kamraj to join in uh, shortly. Uh, I would like to now uh, talk about the fact that in legal thinking, it is helpful for both councils and decision makers that we uncover this narrative by means of images, by means of uh, commending uh, uh, event. Uh, again, I use the Sohakam incident. Uh, we brought uh, uh, Facebook postings of certain regulatory authorities, uh, how they were concerned about proletization. They were concerned about deviant Islamic teachings being found within our country. Uh, and this gave rise to our, our commending to the panel a narrative that an atmosphere of fear uh, that generated against these two individuals. So, in, in, in legal thinking, it is not just pure logic. One of the great American judges said that the life of the law is not just of logic, it is of experience. And experience intersect by the way we comment our narratives. I would like to uh, uh, close with one more example, which I found utterly fascinating. fascinating. This is the public... Uh, a public law, uh, well, this is a criminal defamation case. In 2011, Mat Sabu was a member of PAS. He made a rousing speech in one of the electoral rally that Bukit Kepung incident was not the heroes, the police. In fact, they were employees of the British colonial government. But the then government, of course, uh, Barisa Nation and AMNO whipped up the sentiment that Mat Savu is a Pankhianat, a traitor. He was dragged to court, he was prosecuted under the criminal defamation. But interesting enough for, for me as a, a legal uh, person reading the case, the narrative that Mat Savu is able to convince the court is that the attackers of the Bukit Kapo, Mat Indra, were in fact heroes, not, not the police uh, uh, Bukit Kapong as depicted by the firm made by Jin Samshudin. And, and one of the aspects of the case was commending of historical uh, uh, argumentation 
as to whether Bukit Kapong was under the colonial government rule or whether or not it was independent police officers. Now, again, an example like this shows to us how a plot structure that we commend or the Defence Council for Matsabu found acceptance by the court. And the court looked at historians which also competed in the interpretation of this event. And because of that competing versions, the court says he do not find it safe to convict Matsabu as committed the offence of criminal defamation. There we are, ladies and gentlemen. We find that in the art of legal thinking and persuasion, a whole variety of tools is made available to us. And these tools have to be made uh, by both councils. And if you have clients or you are a decision maker, you must be able to sift through these communications to find yourself making an informed decision that will help you. That is my opening framing of the discussion. I would like now to pass it back to Dr. Paul. Philip, your discourse is indeed impressive, insightful, and incisive. Congratulations. Thank you. I now invite uh, Kamraj to share his views. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? I hope we can. Not. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. So, Carolyn, can I have the German petition writing on the screen, please? That's the PDF that I sent. Okay. I'm going to give what I hope is a, a more concrete example of legal persuasion. Um, it's at the bottom of this page. I don't know if I can scroll it down or not, but it's, it's the, um, that is the right page, but I, I want the, the, yes, that's it. Um, and this, just to give um, some context, because Philip and I are, of course, civil lawyers, but all our um, examples are, of course, criminal law examples, simply because they're that much more accessible. And um, this is from the 1948 MLJ. And I ha we use it as a, it, it has a few rules. It circulates as a sort of underground in-joke between lawyers. And I also use it to test out chambering students in the library to see if they can get through it without, read it out aloud without bursting into laughter. I am just going to try and uh, read it now myself without bursting into laughter to give you some context as to what we're talking about. So it's, uh, as I say, it's in 1948 and it's sent, it's from Tullock Anson, um, which is of course my mother's hometown. Uh, and it starts with the facts of the case are simple. The two petitioners, feeling thirsty after a day's work, grass cutting, went to the toddy shop. With their grass cutting knives on the way home, they fell to belaboring each other, one another with their knives. And the petition reads as follows From Muthu Karapun and Raju, anti malarial laborers, Tulloch Anson, 27th July 1948. And if we could, Caroline, if we could scroll down to the bottom half of the page. To the magistrate, Tulloch Anson, Sir, our heartfelt prayer. It would become the prerogative of your worship station to deign to manifest a kind consideration and the discretionary forgiveness, making allowance for our stark ignorance made worse by drinks. We are not at all trouble causers. We are habitually harmless, quiet and innocent. It is still surprising to us to have committed an offence by unconsciously injuring ourselves. We have long been friends together. We drank together, fought together got arrested together, got admitted, admitted to hospital together, discharged together. Together now we prostrate ourselves at your feet for mercy in our desperate attempt, sorry, our desperate effort to find an, ex, 
an avenue into your human heart from where you would vouchsafe to look with pity. We jointly invoke with our contrite hearts your worship's gracious sympathy and forgiveness. Our getting arrested and sustaining bodily injuries are sufficiently sufficient punishment for us never, never again to commit any such offense in our lives. We most humbly entreat your dignity for an acquittal for deigning to render which aid sought herein at your worship's hands. We would cherish the blessing with the deepest of ever growing, growing gratitude. We could find no conceivable reason whatsoever for a fight between us. We sat together, we together sat down for hours to think of any reason and we couldn't find any. All we know is that we jointly drank in merry friendship. When we came to consciousness, we found ourselves in the hospital. That is all we know. With implicit hope and with the deepest gratefulness, we beg to remain. So you're most obedient. And then X, right thumbprint of Mutha Karpan, X, right thumbprint of Virgil. So uh, unlike most people I've managed to get, the last slide sets out section 324 of the penal code. It essentially says that whoever, it, it, sorry, the, the, the title of it is voluntarily causing hurt by dangerous weapons or means. And essentially it says that whoever voluntarily causes hurt by means of any instrument for, in other words, a, in short, a dangerous weapon, shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 10 years or with fine or with whipping or with any two of such punishments. That, as far as I can tell, applying the other side of my uh, legal brain, as it were, is the offense which Muthu Karapan and Raju, our two anti-malarial laborers, had committed. They had attacked each other with weapons, namely their knives, they had done so much damage to each other that they had managed to get themselves, knock themselves unconscious. And this damage was so severe that they were both hospitalized. And as I said, the punishment for that sort of behavior is essentially imprisonment for up to 10 years or a fine or whipping or any two of, the, of those three. Nevertheless, a petition writer, whose name we don't know, working out of Tullacanson in the late 1940s, managed to persuade a magistrate to give them a caution and discharge for this, what would otherwise seem to be a very serious offense. That, I would suggest, is an almost classic example of the art of legal persuasion. Because ultimately, what this petition writer who couldn't appear before the court, he didn't have a right of audience, so the best he could do was sit with his typewriter and write out a petition for Muthu Karapan and Raju to present. And he had to hope that by doing it that way, he could make the magistrate laugh because it's very, very hard to send somebody to jail when you're laughing your head off. And it obviously worked because they were cautioned and discharged. This same case, I could say, is still doing good in this day and age. Because I remember about 10 years ago, my father, who was also a lawyer in practice in Kutubaru, called me at about this time on a Friday and said, son, I want a copy of the gem facts to me. I said, dad, can it wait till Monday? Because it's Friday evening and I want to go down the park. He said, son, it cannot wait get it to me now. I need it by tomorrow morning at the latest. I said, my God, dad, you're not taking that into court, are you? He said, yes, I am. Now shut up and get off the line and get me that. So of course I did. And of course, in the morning, I woke up early, he called him as soon as I could and said, dad, how did it go? He said, oh, fine, fine. Standard case, two fellows at the kapung, <clears throat> uncle and nephew, hitting each other with parangs, Magistrate just needed an excuse to caution and discharge them. Thank you, son, you gave it to me. So it's still possible. That is, I suppose, the application of precedent, as Philip called it. Because a judge has done it before, another judge, maybe 50, 50 years down the line or so, 60 years down the line, feels that it's safe to do so again. And so once again, two people who don't 
realistically deserve to go to jail, are let off because once upon a time, somebody made the magistrate laugh. So that is what I would suggest as a useful, concrete example of how the art of persuasion can work in a legal context. In amongst all the laughter, which I hope, and I hope somebody at least laughed on having the German petition writing compared to them, in amongst and underneath all that laughter, there's the fact that two fellows who had committed what looks on the face of it like a fairly serious offense, basically got off with a caution and discharge. As to whether it is fair that this should happen, and when on another day, perhaps the week before, two fellows in a similar situation would have ended up doing time, I really can't say. But I think it is proper to say that I think that same magistrate would, even if he had sent someone to jail for it before, the week before, when the next such case came up before him, he wouldn't have looked at it the same way. So I think that is um, what I would suggest as a useful concrete example. That's used up the first half hour of our presentation. So Paul, I think perhaps over to you if you want to put out any questions or fill it. Yeah, Philip, you would like to respond or we invite I, questions? I can have a quick response, uh, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kamaraj. The retrieval from the uh, report of 1948 and the language, you know, it mirrors a certain era and time. That, I mean, I could imagine if you write such a letter now to the magistrate, they would say, what are you saying? All right, just come to the point, mate. Uh, all right, these two guys got drunk. They beat each other up. Why? I don't think they. they I don't think I want to penalize them further. Caution and discharge. But a, a remarkable example. This petition uh, of a pleading and art of rhetoric suitable for those times. Uh, I don't believe that we could write such a thing now and uh, the magistrate. But different way of communicating this. This is the point that Kamraj is making. This is a point where legal thinking, I, I just want to give one, one more example, Paul, and you can then jump in. You know, the very famous case of someone drinking from a bottle and then found as a snail in the bottle. The name of the case is Donny Hughes and Stevenson. And that give birth to what we call in civil a cause of action, a tort law, a duty of care from a manufacturer to the ultimate consumer, although when the case first came to the court, there were there was no precedent, right? So the counsels were able to persuade a very uh, brilliant judge called Lord Atkin that there is a principle that can be commended that a manufacturer should have cognizance that the process of the manufacturing must be such that when you drink a beer bottle or you drink a, a soda, you don't get a snail and you don't get ill. Now, the genesis of this, and this is where we can come in in our discussion, I read in the Learned Law Quarterly Review, is that Lord Atkin, while deliberating this, went home uh, and met his granddaughter. And he asked the granddaughter, child, what do you learn today in Sunday school? And then the child said, Grandpapa, my school, Sunday school teacher taught the story and the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus was asked, asked, the quest, uh, was asked by the uh, Pharisees, who then is my neighbor? And he gave this parable. And Lord Atkin fashioned out the neighborhood principle, the neighbor principle, not quoting religion. I mean, it's not that he's you know, Christian and therefore he applies, you know, it's not like that. He used that as a, a metaphor, a parable, to fashion out a rule which is now part of our courts. We can sue auditors, we can sue uh, doctors, architects and engineers uh, because of this neighborhood principle. Fashioned out by Lord Atkin, while he's deliberating and wrestling with the idea. 
and of course, in the actual ruling, the the law lord made a very clear, analytical, precise principles to demarcate the application of the rule. Do not get us wrong. Huh? Neither Kamra and I are saying you can go to court and tell a fluffy story and you're going to win the case. No, no, no. It is narrative must be backed by logic, analytical clarity and doctrinal principle. And if you're advancing it, you're able to commend to the law lords and to the decision maker why your case should be answered in the affirmative. I thought that may be an interesting illustration how uh, literature, in this case, the New Testament parable of the Good Samaritan, gave birth to a legal doctrine. What do you think, Paul? So this uh, Mutu Karupan and Raju's case, does it mean the law is not very clear about itself, that the final judgment is due to the persuasive skill of the lawyer and the ontological view of the judge that he has a particular worldview at that moment which probably may not be consistent on another day i think uh having but i can say that as an advocate uh, I'm always very conscious that how well or I, how badly I do on any given day can have a tremendous effect on the outcome of the case. Uh, it's uh, a lot of it is obviously to do with the facts. If you've got a strong case, uh, you need. You know, the, the, the best advocate in the world uh, is not necessarily needed. If you've got a very weak case, the best advocate in the world may not do you all that much good. Paul, maybe, yes. maybe Kamraj, I could, I could jump in here. Paul, your point about the worldview of the judge, right? You have a valid point. I remember a case where a man took out a gun and shot dead a woman. And the case he had was that he was, he drank a beer and he was a diabetic person and that distorted his judgment. When we read the judgments, we could see that if a judge has a worldview that, you know, you get intoxicated and you kill someone, I'm, I'm not going to look at you very kindly. And despite the fact that the person was diabetic and taking diabetic medicine, this is actual case. Eh? Uh, and that did not mitigate the judge rigor of the law. Clearly, the Mutu Karupan case and Raju uh, found resonance, perhaps in the colonial magistrate, who is quite given to having a stunga gin in his local club. So he was a bit more emphatic, you know. The point, to put it, put it more scholarly, uh, Paul, there is always an interpretive horizon that a decision maker will bring to bear to a proposition of law, in this case, to uh, ask for a caution and discharge because they were two friends who didn't know what they were doing, uh, and how that interpretive horizon informed the final decision. I mean, I give a, another dramatic example, if I may. Yeah? Uh, the very famous case of Indra Gandhi, right? Indra Gandhi is a Hindu woman, her ex-husband, Converted, took the child. Indogani took nine years through the courts. Now, there come a moment in life where we would wish, and this is Tun Sufian say that in the Brado Memorial Lecture, and it was quoted in the federal court finally after nine years by uh, Zulkifi Makiuddin, that there must not be a sense that when we read a judgment, the judge is somehow motivated by race, gender, or religion. And Zulkifi Maku didn't say that. But when you look back at the case, and this is not in discourtesy of any of the judges who made their decision, there seemed to be a link to the fact that uh, there is an issue of religion involved. Uh, but finally, in the federal court, 
a bench of Muslim judges, including a very courageous Muslim lady, Tansri Zainun, vindicated this lady to say that a marriage done in a civil marriage has to be properly dissolved before the individual could take the child and the custody issues must be resolved under civil law, not trumped by personal religious law. Now, this is an example, uh, Paul, of the interpretive horizon of which a decision maker approach the application of rules of law. Similar, perhaps a bit more dramatic than this intoxication case, but nonetheless very humorous, the toxic intoxication case. I hope that example is useful, Paul. Can I continue the discussion? Unless somebody has some questions. We understand law is not in the category of the natural sciences. Uh, therefore, we accept the constructivist or interpretivist approach to resolving some disputes. In that context, how would you reinterpret the case of Atticus in To Kill a Mockingbird? Over to you. Why you 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 are the literary expert? I haven't gone around to reading it yet. All right. The interesting the 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 power of the killer mockingbird. I understand. Is that for many young lawyers who read that uh, when they were in college, that motivated them to be lawyers. Uh, my my retired judge friend Dato Mahadev Shankar in a book that he recently published on legal anecdotes. He took a photograph of the, in a, temp, in a temp, uh, temple uh, garden of a kid holding, holding the uh, book and the epigraph of Charles Lamb. I presume that lawyers were children once. That epigraph featured in Harper's Lee to Kill a Mockingbird. Your question now, I come, come straight to, the, to, to you. I'm not trying to escape, Paul. Uh, when Atticus failed, all right, the jury, uh, the the court held the black man to be guilty. There was one very very poignant moment. All right, Jeb Scout, the the, the, the daughter of uh, uh, of Atticus, uh, was in dismay, and and he tell the father, Dad. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. I don't have the book in front of me. Yeah, Dad, how can it be? This man was innocent, and then Atticus says. Child, this will happen again, not just now, it will happen again and again. This, the point, your, the question, come again, your question, Paul, sorry, uh, now that I got carried away. Uh, no, my question is, how do you, how would you reinterpret this case in light of the Raju's case? Ah, no, no, okay. Well, I don't know whether you can actually draw the... Uh, the, 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 the issue of a literary imaginative uh, was narrative this of a failure in persuasion on the part of the lawyer. Well, I think if we watch the movie of Gregory Peck, uh, he was pretty persuasive and many of us would be moved, right? But the, the whole context of the South, I think, uh, of Harper Lee, how the jury would nonetheless still convict because he's a black man, and, and not much further now, even despite the reflection of time in Donald Trump's uh, Midwest country, where black man is being shot dead, even though he's just jogging, right? We, we, we have the whole range of that my point that I made in my first slide, institutional uh, values that were make a play in decision making, both by jury, if there's a jury trial in Malaysia, no more jury trial, or even in the judges, which are all too human at times. So I don't think, uh, Paul, with respect, we can extrapolate about Atticus case and the uh, 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 the, the two uh, drunk drunk who got discharged. All right, slightly uh, different. Uh, yes, so if I can just chime in on that. Question from the floor, and uh, the question is: Therefore, is objectivity really possible? in the court of law. I'm not sure go at it. Okay. Uh, 
Yes, I think the, the answer is clearly yes. There will be most cases are dealt with on an objective basis. 90% of civil cases, I would say, certainly. 90% of criminal cases, as you, uh, when, when you, when I look back, I, I think that most of the cases I've seen have been fairly straightforward. Of course, these aren't the cases that I spent most of my time on because they're so straightforward that anyone can take an objective view of them. And the answer is clear. It's the other 10%, if you like, that takes up 90% of our time, that takes up a lot of the court's time. And there's a simple saying that hard cases make bad law. And that's very often the case. But there are cases where there's a clear, uh, at best, there is a clear case for sympathy. And at the same time, there's a clear legal case against that person who is thought to deserve sympathy. So it is when that tension arises and falls to be resolved that you get difficulties with whether the judge is being subjected to. But the reality of the matter is that in most cases, it is dealt with uh, justice is done objectively because there really isn't much room to do a lot else. It, but of course, it is those cases like Muthukaupan and Rajus where it doesn't happen like that and where the fun starts. I could add, uh, Paul, that judges train in their field and I, acting as an arbitrator before and come rush to as an adjudicator, when we face with two counsels, it, there's a fascinating story of a King James court where he says, you know, the court is my court. Why am I not hearing cases? And then the attorney general turned pale and said, sire, please don't, don't do that. No, 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 no. That's called call, call the counsels. So, of course, uh, the Queen's counsel started some, uh, the attorney general started submitting and he said, pretty clear. I think I, I you know. Well, what's the problem? And then, and then, of course, the King's counsel said, Sir, I need to reply. He said, Okay, reply. At the end of reply, he said, Shit, sorry for the follow to word. He probably didn't use that word, but he said, It is a bit more complicated than I thought. All right. Um, the issue of the quest for justice is a large issue and fairness between contesting parties in the litigation. The power of the state in a criminal litigation weighs heavily because. The rules will make it very strict liability. The owners of uh, burden of proof will shift in their provisions. Presumptions are always loaded against the accused. And that's why you need an advocate to fight a hell, right? In, in a breach of contract, similarly, for a judge to be objective, of course, the losing party will say, he read it all wrong. And some counsel will say, the stupid arbitrator just got it all wrong, right? and because the client just lost millions uh, out of their ruling. At the end of the day, the whole language game, if I may use a, a philosophical term, all right, between the contesting parties, councils, is using a form of logic, narrative, evidence, to persuade the court that these issues can be objectively decided by the decision maker in favor of the client's case. Now, at the end of that objective evaluation, one can argue there is a dimension of the judge interpretive horizon, which is subjective, not in the narrow sense of emotional, of how he would like to look at the particular document, give way to it, how you look at the section, give way to the wordings and the structure of construction. These issues are pervasive. In that sense, the final decision, I agree with Kamraj, is an objective evaluation with the interpretive horizon of the judge bringing into play to give way to whatever he or she wants to give way to. Do you agree with that, Kamraj? Yeah, if I could just pick up on that, Philip. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we can see the gem in petition writing sure. as a really brilliant exercise in making a judge look at this from a different angle. Yeah. Because objectively, we know that when people whack each other with glass cutting knives and end up in the hospital, there really ought to be some criminal consequence. But the genius of this unknown petition writer was that he was able, with a letter, to make the judge see things from a different angle. Yes. And really, I think, just to pick up on something you said before, Philip, I think, um, or you said, Dr. Paul, if somebody, if a lawyer had gone into court and said, look, your worship, or look, sir, magistrate, all these people have done is do exactly what you did last week at the Lord Parrot Club, where you and the uh, magistrate from Bidor got drunk and started hitting each other with hockey sticks or whatever they used to do at the Lower Parrot Club. Uh, so, and you're not in jail, so why should they be? I can guarantee you that that sort of submission has never, ever worked in the last hundred years or so. But what he did was he made him laugh. And as I said at the beginning, it's very difficult to make some to send somebody to jail when, you, when you're laughing. And he turned his weakness into his strength. He wasn't, as a petition writer, allowed to appear before the judge and tell a long story, so he had to write him a letter. And he wrote him a letter that was so overblown that the judge laughed his head off, thought, I'll send it to the MLJ, and thought, I really can't send this to the MLJ if I said, I paid no attention to this and sent them to jail anyway. So that's, I think, a classic example of how you bring it a skilled advocate. And this man, this anonymous man, must have been a very great advocate. Uh, he used his skill to make it subjective, to make an ordinary, open and shut, objective case into a subjective one. Is there any question, uh, if not, I can introduce a topic about Realism in boardroom decision making in commercial life. Yeah. Okay, please. Yeah. I think I think in the course of my solicitor's work, uh, moving from the academic to boardrooms, I was once in a public listed company. I can see that regulators, you know, they they love to make rules. And I talk to businessmen, and I I, I work with them. They said, as far as they're concerned. And, and this is back by economic theory, Paul, all right, the Cosian theory. Yeah? Co Cos says that for every regulation, and I'm bastardizing his argument, uh, the businessmen will find ways to circumvent it, all right, because it increased the cost of doing business. Every, every new rule increased the cost of doing business. The rule of Section 17A, where the corporate veil is will be lifted, and if a runner go and pays a commission, the board can be charged individually, all right, if they did not set up adequate procedures, uh, is a rule that a lot of uh, businessmen is saying, why do you, do you want to implement this now? We are just trying to survive the MCO. Uh, I bought lorries and now I need a transport license and the clerk is not moving the license. The lorries cost me a couple of hundred thousand, all right, and I need to run it to, to pay the higher purchase company. But the clerk is not moving it if I give him 200 ringgit. Now, I'm not commending Im um, immorality and corruption. Eh? I I'm just giving an example how rules increase the cost of doing business. And in my career advising boardroom decision making, the pressure of directors having to deal with the realistic business environment is seriously burdensome. And when we begin to explain the rules to them, some of them get pretty impatient. I had one case when I was advising a GLC and a, a, a then government nominee from uh, the uh, then ruling party, AMNO, said to me, Mr. Ko, I don't need a lecture from you. Then I have to respectfully say, sir, uh, this is my duty to, to explain to you your, your fiduciary duties. And of course, the other director stand him down. But we as lawyers are also faced with being pushed back and sometimes one of the greatest challenge I have, and I must confess, is to try to 
modify my opinion to please my client because he wants to hear that answer. But the danger for him is that when it, the shit hit the fan in a, uh, three years' time or three months' time, he will then not remember that I told him you can't do this. He just shut me up. Uh, and, and I will be in trouble. Uh, the point I'm making here is the realism of marketplace, the decision-making process, are very burdensome. And as lawyers operating in the marketplace, and even for Kamaraj in this construction dispute, there are grave issues of financial, property, and liability involved. I, I agree with you, Philip. The cost theorem applies very well to the Malaysian economy because this, this political economy has created a non-competitive market. That's why the transaction costs are very high because we are producing at the suboptimal level. So production is non-optimal and distribution is also non-optimal. So that's why the transaction costs are high. And the rent, and the rent paid, the rental capitalists uh, paid, uh, increase the cost tremendously. Yeah, the transaction costs are just go out the window. Oliver, uh, Oliver Williamson's thesis, yeah. Yeah, by the way, uh, Professor Coles is a Nobel Prize winner for economics, although he discusses legal... No, no, interesting issues. thing is that he is actually a contract law lecturer. Oh, so he, okay. It, it was by accident, he suddenly got a paper written and then it became a, 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 it became a Nobel Prize winning uh, thesis, mm -hmm. the Coles' theorem of how regulators uh, will find ways to minimize their cost trans transactions, and the regulation will therefore become uh, moribund, you know? Uh, so it comes back to one question that uh, some of the participants are asking, but in a different way. Sure. Is the art of, is a persuasion an art or a science? Or intuitively, we'll say it's a combination of both. I should, I should turn this. Okay, come right, go ahead. I, okay, I, I um, the, the thing that came to mind actually was a quote about cricket captaincy. And I think it was Bradman, one of the Australian captains, said, Look, it's 90% luck and 10% skill, but don't try it without the 10%. <laughs> and I, I, I think it really is something like that. It's, um, it, is, it is both art and science uh, and a lot of luck. And the one thing I think that is, uh, as I keep saying, the one thing that's common to all the good advocates and the great advocates that I've seen is actually the hard work, the, the preparation, the understanding of their case and of their client, and then the thought that goes into how, how best to package that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is, um, uh, I suppose, um, the other way of putting it is that um, art, any, any art, is, is not, um, to, to, to suggest that art, you know, to suggest that there's a clear distinction between art and science um, may not actually be accurate in this case. It's, at the end of the day, it's all hard work. So there's, according yeah. to some, comments probably is more subjectivism than positivism. Well, this takes us to a whole area of legal philosophy. In the heyday in the uh, 19th century and early 20th, I remember going to, uh, if you go to Harvard Law School, there's this Langdell Law School. Langdell uh, and a group of people like Jell Austin in UK and England they, they use, they look at it, they wanted to justify the study of law as a legal science. So they created the case method, they created analytical jurisprudence. Then we have, of course, uh, the great H.L.A. Hart, who borrowed uh, Wittgenstein ideas. But the issue of it being a legal science is defined, as Kamraj says, the word science there is, of course, not in the empirical sense of uh, scientific discoveries, right? not in the sense of a laboratory environment. Uh, the, the law is a social science. 
uh, humanities. It deals with uh, language of how you organize society and norms. It is in that sense, it has a certain rigor. It has certain analytical scientific principles of which if you depart too far from, you will not be able to be recognized. But in the art of it, the, today our main discussion is the rhetorical uh, discourse. And again, in discourse analysis, if we go into that, uh, there is certain principles, you can call it scientific within the discourse analysis uh, <clears throat> domain. So it is an intersection between a science and art. And I think not in the sense of an empirical science in the laboratory environment. I would like to uh, ask both of you to give a general comment, but it's somewhat out of this uh, theme. Recently, various people with disabilities have spoken out that they are not just marginalized, but because of the COVID-19, they have suffered tremendously. As lawyers, how do you look at people with disabilities? Are there people with a deficit? That means inadequate in terms of bodily functions? Or are we as a society that have given a construct, con a social construct that actually we are the people who have disabled them that what they suffer are just impairments, but not disabled. What are the views of lawyers? Because at this moment, this is a very serious problem. I'm not sure this is something or... out of our discussion. No, but no, because... no, it, it is relevant. I I have a view, but Kamraj, you would like to say something first? Well, I, I think my view is that has always been that um, we speak of, we should be speaking of people who are differently abled rather than disabled. Uh, the sad reality is that, as Dr. Paul says, the way we have constructed our society makes it very, very difficult for some of these people to uh, to function, uh, we, uh, to, to, to thrive as well, or even to survive. That's something that I wish we could fix. Maybe uh, I jump in here, uh, Hamraj. The Disabled Act in Malaysia, we have an act actually, a parliament. When you read it, it's, it is not even a law. It is pure exotitary. Unlike in Europe, I, I think it's partly because Post-war, the Allied, you know, they fought the war, and the veterans came home. They were there was a huge cachet of electorate that needed protection because of their war wounds. All right, so in those countries, they took a very practical and enlightened view in protecting the disabled. In many of our countries where we did not face that kind of veterans coming home with power to vote. We, we have weakness in the law protection. And, and your, your point is well made, Paul. Why is it, I mean, you're talking to two lawyers, which essentially our clients are fairly well-to-do, uh, well-heeled clients. Of course, we do, we do some pro bono work. But I totally agree with you. The marginalized, the poor, the voiceless, the disabled, they, they too need clarity and protection of law. And on the philosophical sense, when John Rawls wrote his great thesis on theory of justice, he seemed to think that human beings are all rational, legal, conscient kind of people. Then there are a group, a group who challenge him and say, you have left out the marginalized. You have left out the disabled, all right? Uh, for example, a Harvard uh, a thinker called Martha Nussbaum has passionately argued, though she accepted Rawls' great achievement uh, in rethinking about what justice is, he said that we must factor in the, the specific subjectivity of the human person who are not fully uh, with rational or, or even uh, bodily faculties. The law must accommodate it. 
justice, any notion of justice in society must accommodate it. And now, now that is just in the terms of legal thinking. I think in practical form, civil society continue to remind lawyers are not men merely to protect property rights. Lawyers must do their part in defending the voiceless and the disabled. Good reminder, Paul. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. So unless there are other questions, we have to end this uh, very, very brilliant uh, discourse from the two of you. And uh, we are proud to have legal minds like yours that have raised uh, the standard of thinking in our country. And I hope that uh, your quality of thinking is also reflected in our practices at the court level and in our way of looking at legal and paralegal matters. It's good to end the discussion with a reminder about from, from, from Professor Rawls' uh, distributive justice that development is more than just chasing GDP per capita income and material uh, accumulation that we always forget the other non-material uh, aspects of life, the spiritual aspect. And I think in the context of COVID-19, we have this opportunity to rethink about many values and so on, not just legal, but many of them are also legal because we noticed that in the case of uh, people with disabilities, Although we have some legislations and so on, but the uh, support services are not there. They are almost, if not totally, forgotten. Uh, so I, I bring this up so that uh, perhaps uh, somebody um, might hear what we say, although it's not meant to be like that. Uh, so we thank you again for your precious time, and we hope you don't send me a bill since you only... <laughs> We thank health. 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 health team okay. and thank the participants for so patiently listening to our little uh, ramblings, right? We appreciate the opportunity. Kamraj and I deeply uh, appreciate it. Yeah, we'll, we'll meet again, I'm sure, yeah. Thank you again oh, so much and, and all the participants. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank you, Kamraj. Bye, Paul. Bye. Thank you everyone for tuning in to this very enlightening session from Health University. Our moderator, Dr. 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 Paul Chan, and Mr. Philip Ko and Mr. Kamraj Nayak. And thank you very much, everybody, once again. Uh, Selamat Haraya to everybody. Have a safe weekend. Salam. <laughs>